Hi there. This video is going to be slightly different to my usual tutorials in that it is my first impressions of the current beta version of Blender 2.8. I haven't spent more than a few hours really using this in total, so I'm still very much learning my way around it. So my very first impression was, oh dear, I don't know where anything is. I have subsequently start to get to grips with it. One of the key differences is the timeline down here. So you can see by default, and this is all still pretty much default settings. It looks a little different. We haven't got all of the usual icons that we're used to seeing down here to click on. Many of them have actually moved over to here, and I will highlight those that I have become familiar with. We haven't got the usual menu on the left-hand side. We've got this menu. It's still opened and closed with T, but it looks quite a bit different. Being a beta, there are still bugs with it, and certainly one of the bugs I've quickly come across is the specials menu, which is normally opened with W, so you use that very often to subdivide a mesh, but for me that doesn't seem to be working. I think it worked once and then stopped working. Now what it does is it goes to circle select, so there's probably some reason for that, but I'm not sure. There's quite a lot of contextual menus in Blender 2.8 as there were in Blender 2.79. If I press N, that still brings up the familiar or relatively familiar menu on the right hand side. So we've got a few things in here that I didn't see in it before. So the Ivy generators appeared over here. I haven't played around with that in Blender 2.8 yet. So you can see there's a set of new icons down here. And these are some of the first ones you'll need to get used to. I should say, of course, that one of the key differences for the default settings in Blender 2.8 is that it's left click rather than right click. Now, although that's very deeply ingrained in me and having used Blender for several years, you relatively quickly get used to switching over. So especially as someone who's giving tutorials, I knew that I would have to switch over to the default settings in Blender. Otherwise, I would be at odds with the version of Blender that people were using when they just download and install it. But you fairly quickly get used to it being left click rather than right click to select things. So I've just turned something on there and I'll explain what that is now. What I've turned on is overlays. So you can turn them on and off very quickly here. And you can see with them on, you get the familiar outline of anything that you selected. A little note about selection. If I press A, you'll notice I selected everything. But it doesn't matter how many times I press A, unless I double click it very quickly, everything stays selected. So A is not a toggle anymore to select everything. If you press it twice very quickly, there does seem to be a shortcut to deselect everything. So that's fine. But normally to deselect, it's Alt-A. You can see my key press is down on the left-hand side here. So Z will bring up a pie menu. Not a huge fan of pie menus, but they are considered to be the thing at the moment. So you can obviously quickly select which of the views you want. Alternatively, you can select your view down here. So we can press this one and we can see wireframe. This one is our standard material view. This one is our texture view. And then this one is our shaded view. So it'll take a moment. I'm in cycles mode at the moment and I've been playing around with EV to look at the differences between EV and a cycles render. So obviously I've put some volumetrics in this render and it takes a little while and it's quite noisy. Another little point in Blender 2.7 you can just click somewhere, left click somewhere and the 3D cursor will move. You can see my 3D cursor is there and it's not going anywhere. The reason for that is I actually need to tell it that I want to move the 3D cursor and then left click somewhere and then it moves. It's taking me a little while to get used to that, but I don't see that's a major problem. Obviously, we've got our pause button here. Now, a little bit about the overlays. You'll notice, although we're in cycles view, we're still seeing the object that I've got selected. So if I select the ship here, so it's still rendering the scene, but you can see that is the object I've got selected. So that's quite useful when you're needing to make tweaks to a model or a mesh and see how it affects the rendered version. If you don't want to see that though, you need to turn off overlays. You can quickly do that by just clicking this here and you can see it's completely vanished, but that will vanish no matter what scene you're in. You can, however, choose specific things that you want to see and others that you don't. You can play around with these options in here. You can turn the grid on and off, for example. You can see the grids just appear down there. It's obviously not visible in the rendered version. If you right click on an object, you'll actually get an object context menu. So you can quickly switch on, for example, smooth shading or flat shading. I've just turned on flat shading there and a few other options as well. One of the things that I'm not too keen on at the moment is 
how you open a new window. Essentially, it works the same way. It took me a little while when I first came to Blender to work out how to drag and open a new window. I saw lots of people doing it on tutorials, but I hadn't quite realized that it was the little chevrons in the corner. Those chevrons have disappeared, and all we've got is this little rounded area. And I found this to be the case in a lot of the options. The hot area, the area you need to click, is actually quite small. Now that might be something to do with the size I've got set up for my menu. So there are settings under preferences to control things like the size of the menu. I think when I first installed Blender 2.8, it was sort of a little bit too big. It was very much like the current fashion for very big menus that really frankly get in the way. For me, I want them to maximize the screen space. But you can still essentially drag the window in the same way. You just need to go right into that little corner and then drag down and then you'll get a new window open up. So how do you change the windows? You click down here in a very similar way to Blender 2.7. They've renamed things slightly. So where we just had one node window before and we changed the mode of the node window, we've now got different node windows. So if I select Shader Editor, you can see that we're now looking at, if I select that, we're now looking at Object. So this is now a material. So if we zoom in a little bit, you can see We've got some texture coordinates there, we've got some mapping, and then ultimately it comes out to the material output in here. I quite like the colouring of the nodes. I think that's an option even in Blender 2.7. What I'm not so keen on, and it may well be that there is an option to change that, is these straight connectors. I felt that the Bezier curves were more elegant and frankly easier to follow when you start to get a more complicated setup. These straight lines, they're basically uglier and also I don't think are as easy to read as curved lines that give you this general flow. But that's just a minor thing really. So if I want to look at the node for say the world, so this would be the sky, I go to world up here and there we have the nodes I've got for literally the sky. I haven't looked into what line style's all about yet. So I can then switch to compositing. So it's still a node editor, but now it's compositing nodes and all the familiar nodes are still there. Again, we've got these straight links. I've been playing around with this one, looking at different settings and how they work between cycles and EV. But other than that, they ba it basically works in the same way. And evidently there's a texture node editor as well. As I say, this is my first impressions and there's so much to get to grips with. So much has changed that it's taking me time to really get through it and understand what it's all about. So coming over to the menus over here, this element is very similar. One thing you may have noticed we're missing is layers. So layers have, at least by their name, completely vanished from Blender 2.8. They are still there in a way, but they're now called collections. They work slightly differently to layers. They're more flexible than layers and you can have more of them is my understanding. Obviously, we had a finite number of layers in Blender 2.7. It's now an, probably a very large number of layers that you can have. And also we can see what's in each layer by looking at this. So they're called collections now. So effectively, you're grouping or creating a collection of objects that you are associating together in some way and then determining whether they're going to be visible. So we've got the eye symbol. We've got the selection symbol here to obviously prevent you changing something. We've got this symbol here, which will disable it in the viewport. And we've got this symbol here, which is obviously to remove it from render. If we click to open that collection, we can see what we've got in there. We can see there's a sort of highlight on this one, which is this is the object we have selected. If I select this one, what we can see is this one is in a different collection. These are default collections, by the way. They aren't ones I've built. They've been, I guess, created by Blender 2.8 reading what layer things were in and creating a new collection for whatever was in that layer. So you can see that this object, this landscape object, is somewhere in collection number two because we've got a highlight around it there. We've got that triangle and then around it is a of lighter circle. So if I open that, we can see there's actually only one object in there and that one is highlighted. So that's the one I've got selected there. And one of the good things about it is it does give you a hint as to what sort of objects are in any given collection. So I can see that in collection one, I've got some meshes, I guess identified by this triangle and there seems to be the number two next to it. So I'm guessing there are two meshes. Yep, one is the volumetric mesh that I've set up and the other one is the alien ship. But we can also see that there is a lamp in this collection even without opening it. So if I open it, there it is, it's the sun. So that's quite good. That gives you a very quick indication of what's in there and what it might be for. And of course, you can rename them.
however you want to. Now you notice here, this was obviously a layer that was created as a collection that was not in my active render. And that's really because I had some objects in here which I was using as particles, which are the particles that are appearing down here. And therefore that one is hidden and it's also disabled in the viewport. If I click that, you can see my objects appear here, or I could just click one of them and it will appear. That's very good on the collection side. That's what I've learned so far. Evidently you can search for things as well. So that's quite good. A little about the next menu down. So they've taken all the menus which were appearing along horizontally and they put them vertically. I can sort of see why they're doing that. I've always had a bit of an issue with menus don't have any text with them, but of course those never did. And you do get a hint if you just hover next to it. And I think you can set that delay as well. They're not all obvious. I am starting to get used to them. So if I select an object, you'll notice also if I select my ship, for example, I'll just turn that collection off. We've got that sort of sphere. That's our material. That's somewhat similar to the way it was. I miss them being color. I think they could have been at least had a little bit of color in them or if they had a little bit of color in them, like Blender 2.7, I'd have been able to locate them more quickly, whereas I have to look a little more carefully, especially with the relatively small menu that I have, just to identify what it is. So I think we can work out some of them. That's obviously textures. This is materials. This is textures. Here we have particles. There's no particle system on this one. If I select this object, you can see we have got a particle system, and this is presumably physics. So they've changed the icon for physics, but other than that, it looks like it's about the same. If we come back up to the very top, I'm not really sure what this one is telling us at the moment. It looks to have options for add-ons in there. So this is the main one. This is the scene. This is one of the more significant ones. So you can see it's set to render engine cycles at the moment. They've got this feature set as in Blender 2.7 and GPU compute. They've rearranged quite a few things, but essentially everything is there. You'll just find yourself searching for it, but obviously that'll just take a little bit of time to get used to. Everything you know should be there is there. And then you've got advanced versions as well. We've still got our little clock I see for seed. Some of this I'm actually coming across as we're looking through it. Some of it I need to spend a little bit of time with. And then there's our familiar max bounces clamping we're used to seeing and the core sticks under separate menus rather than being visible straight away and you can obviously set presets as well. It'd be nice to be able to just click perhaps the top of light path and have all of the options available straight away and again we have our normal options for settings down here. Don't seem to see an automatic tile size in here so it may be that I'll have to set up my preferred size and leave it at that. Perhaps I decided it wasn't working very well or maybe that add-on just hasn't been enabled yet. So a little bit of what I've learned so far about how it all works. If I press G, I can still move things around as normal. I can click here on the hand symbol to move the display around. And obviously that's just toggling between camera view and not. So when we click transform, we'll get something approximating the original gizmo. I'm not so keen on this format. It is one I've used before, but it's very easy to accidentally pick up the rotate option rather than whichever move option. And you can see there's even a scale option in there. It may be possible to limit it to what you actually want to do, perhaps by holding a key down or something, but I'm not sure how that might work at the moment. So it's additional functionality, but maybe a little tricky to use at times, but okay. We can obviously turn those overlays off and on as normal. So what many of you are probably waiting to see is EV. So let's go to a render. So I'm in cycles mode at the moment. So I can just click down here under shading and just cl click this one to go to rendered view. Now this is the cycles mode right now. I'm going to turn the overlays off to make it look a little nicer. Now I've actually been playing with this scene to make it work better in EV. So the volumetrics is a little dense for the cycles render, but I think it looks okay. One of the key differences is that I think the volumetrics is working quite well. Obviously quite noisy. It clearly will need some denoising if I rendered it like this. And if I come out of the camera view and move around a little bit, you can see how that's working. I'll go back to camera view now. So that's rendering at 25 samples, I believe. You can see over there. Obviously this is just preview render mode at the moment. So what we'll now do is I'll just switch straight over to EV mode. So there it is, EV. And I'm in GPU compute. And you can see how it sort of thinks about it for a little while. Obviously what's missing initially is the volumetrics and that's because I've got it turned off right now. The materials are basically there as are the textures. If I move this around, we can see a little bit more of what's going on. So it's not too bad. So this is EV rendering. It's doing it in real time 
it looks OK. I haven't turned any of the options that have appeared here on yet. So let's go back to camera view and the main one is volumetric. So let's turn that on. And you can see it's immediately a fairly acceptable render. Now there are issues with EV and I'll talk about those in a minute. It's not the answer to everything, but that's certainly in terms of the sort of renders I was doing a few years ago, that's fine. Something I have played around with is actually using EV to do the volumetric rendering that Cycles struggles with and then compositing that into a Cycles render. That's certainly something I'm going to look into more as Blender 2.8 beta develops. We can also add things like bloom and so on in there. That doesn't make a huge difference to this scene because most of the bloom is coming from a single light source and it's coming from a light source which is embedded in a volumetric which causes bloom anyway. So it actually, in this case, doesn't make a huge difference. But here's something that's quite interesting. If I move out of the camera view, so apart from this sort of shadowing you see for a moment, this is rendering at a very, very surprisingly fast speed. So you can see why Bloom doesn't really do an awful lot. I can click it and we get a little bit more, a slightly larger effect on the light. This is just a point source light. I tried it with a sun lamp and it didn't really work because the sun lamp's at infinity effectively. But if I go back to camera view, you can even see we've got effectively God rays being generated by the shadows. And if I come in close to the landscape, you really get that impression of volumetric mist really in the air. So for certain effects and certain scenes, that's very much an acceptable result. If I go to a new scene now, Shift A still works to add an object. And I'm just added a mesh, simple mesh there. And I'm going to be a little slower than normal because I'm still sort of working my way through this. Let's go for a sort of darkish green color. Now we still have the option to change what the material looks like in the 3D viewport, but instead of being at the bottom now, it's at the top under viewport display, which I guess is a more logical place, and we can just drag it in there. By default, you get a principal shader as well. So that's got that. Let's add a UV sphere. Just bring that up to here. And I've obviously got my 3D cursor down below somewhere. And we'll now add an icosphere. I'm going to select my UV sphere, right click it and say smooth shading. So that's quite an efficient way to do it. I'm going to then select my icosphere and scale it down a little bit. See, I still haven't quite got used to needing to do that to move 3D cursor. I imagine there's a key combination, shift space bar, apparently. Oh, by the way, the other change is pressing space bar starts your animation. Now that's good because I do a lot of switching between Adobe Premiere and Blender and Premiere uses, and as do many other programs, uses the space bar to start and stop the time sequence. Blender, of course, didn't used to do that or Blender 2.7 and earlier doesn't do that. So I would often press space bar in Blender and it would bring up another menu. That said, I rather miss that menu. Home clearly does not take you to the beginning. I'm not sure what takes you to the beginning of the timeline the moment other than clicking there shift left arrow okay so shift left shift right take you to the start and end that's one of the good things they do seem to have well populated a lot of the tool tips and you can see we've got our start and stop menus there and i'm just going to add you can still drag colors and for the sphere i'm going to make that metallic and we'll take the roughness all the way down for the moment so by default, it's gone back to CPU. So I'm going to go to GPU for render. I miss having the buttons here. They're now up here. My buttons have moved themselves up to here. That's obviously the default positioning for them. And so I was looking for them down here and they're actually up here. So let's just click rendered view. So we haven't got any lamp beyond the general sky in the scene yet. So let's just go back to here and add. We'll add a point light for the moment. Middle mouse button still seems to work. So if we go to rendered view now we'll go to world say use nodes and we'll set the world to black for the moment so that's not looking too bad this is cycles by the way but obviously it's a very simple scene right now but what i want to do is just to show some of the effects or differences really between cycles and ev just to be clear ev at least currently is not the answer to all our dreams but it may well be that there are applications for it outside of purely developing for games. Certainly I'm giving some thought to creating some VR content possibly using EV as the render engine. So I'm going to turn off the overlays now so we're not distracted. And I'm going to make a few changes to optimize first of all the cycles render. So viewports at 32, we'll leave that at 32. 
and we'll come to light paths. We're not using it yet, but I'll put volumetrics at two. I'll leave everything else at default. I'm going to put direct clamping up to seven and I'm going to turn caustics off. I do have a reflective object here, but we haven't really got any caustic reflections right now. So that's okay. That's a reasonably nice version of the scene. And I draw your attention to the shadows. That's why I raised these objects up. So if I look at my collection, you see there's my point lamp. Let's go to the lamp settings and we can change how it works. Size is currently 0.25. Let's set that to zero. And you can see we've got completely sharp shadows. And if we set it to one, we get completely fuzzy shadows. So I'm going to go to point 0.1 for the moment. So it's a good midpoint really. The object that's closer to its shadow has got a sharper shadow than the one that's further away. And you can see there's a good definition between shadows there. I think what I'm going to do actually is copy that icosphere. I turn my overlays back on. You can see this is how it's useful. Shift D is normal. And then Control 2 to apply a subdivision surface. Right click and say smooth shading. So I'm already starting to get more comfortable with it. I wanted to do that really just to get some smooth transition shadows on that sphere. And perhaps we'll give that its own material so we'll click the little two there and we'll give that a little bit of less roughness which will turn up the shininess there you go perhaps change the color slightly and we'll make this light green or maybe yellow we're getting some good green reflections from the surface there and maybe we'll put some reflection on the surface as well by just turning the roughness down there we go so you can see how that works quite differently using the principal shader but obviously that's available in blender 279 so at this point, let's have a look at how that compares between Cycles and EV. So it's a, still a very simple scene, a few mesh objects, a few shiny objects, one lamp and some moderately sharp shadows. So you have to click this, which I guess is supposed to look like a computer and switch to EV. Initially, it looks weird, but then obviously it bakes in the textures. And the first obvious thing is that the sky has gone all light. So I'm not entirely clear why it does that. To click to use nodes and use nodes again and it's now gone black as it should be so it may just be that switching between cycles business that's causing it a problem so immediately we can see that it's more cartoon like the shadows are much sharper the colors are much simpler there's a real problem with this shiny sphere over here the only thing that seems to be reflected at the moment is the lamp it's a nice clean image but it's a very simple one but we've got some options we can play with over here so we haven't got any volumetrics in this one at the moment. But what if we start with screen space reflections? So turning that on, suddenly it's a little better. We've now got some reflections back here. I noticed some lights appeared here and we have something at least approximating some reflections over here. And there's clearly some options within here. If we say refraction, perhaps that's going to make a difference. No, clearly refraction will have to be for something where you're perhaps looking through some glass or something like that. There are a number of settings here, but obviously I'm not really trying to say one is better than the other. Cycles is better for creating a physically accurate representation of what a scene would look like given the conditions that it's illuminated with. EV is about approximating that, but doing it very quickly and cleanly. I'm really just pointing out how they differ as render engines. So you can see there are some issues here. Right at that edge there, there's some problems and so on, which maybe playing around with this might be able to address. In fact, it's, that's exactly what it seems to have done but I notice something's changed over there as well. So there's a lot of work to do to sort of work out exactly what this does for you. And no doubt it slows things down. We can of course turn on this bloom effect. It's a very popular effect in games and play around with the radius and the intensity of it and so on. Raising the threshold so it's not quite as extreme. It's a common effect in games and things like that. Useful perhaps if you've got a very bright light source and something like that, and you can reduce the intensity of it there. Ambient occlusion, there won't be a lot to see in this particular scene. Depth of field, you obviously need to set depth of field up, but looking through the camera, you can see it's varying. We can set where that depth of field occurs in the usual manner by going to the camera settings. If I set that to the icosphere, there you go, that's come in focus. So we can play around with the depth of field here, but it's a passable effect. So let's just come out of that for a moment and let's just add remembering that it's left click. I've taken a copy of that sphere. I'm going to go to its materials. I'm going to remove that material, say a new one. And this time I'm going to select principled volume. Now that's not one I've noticed before in 2.7. I've missed it if, if it is in there. And I've told it that it's volumetric. So let's go back to rendered mode. 
and look through the camera. So I set the density to zero to begin with and nothing's happening. And I think the reason for that is because we need to turn on volumetric rendering. So if we come down here, there they are, switch that on, go back to the material. So the reason that it's not working is because that's gone into the surface. So let's remove that and we need to put it into volumetric. I'm more used to working with the node editor rather than doing it through here. So we go to here, principled volume, there we go. Interesting that it's a cube rather than a hemisphere. And set the density perhaps to 0.25, maybe even 0.1, and maybe scale it up a little. And if we come back to here, you can see if we turn it off, it's gone. If we turn it on, it's back. And I notice there's a tile size. Now, if we look at the edge of this, something I've noticed is it seems to do an iterative process. So as I'm moving around, you can see there's a very coarse attempt to do the volumetrics, and then it gets better after a second or so. And I notice there's a tile size. So if I go to 16, we look along this edge it does seem to recalculate it as I zoom in, but you can see very definite edges as if it's creating planes, which may be how they're doing it. So I now change this to two pixels. Yes, it's definitely got more. So it's obviously finer, doing more iterations to give you a, a smoother effect, but presumably takes longer. And I notice we've got a samples here, so let's put this up to 128. Yep, you can see it's recalculating again and has to do that each time you move. So obviously, as it would in cycles, volumetric slows things down. So let's switch over to cycles now and see how that compares. So the key obvious difference with cycles is that my volumetric area is very much limited to the shape of the mesh which has that material. So if I look outside of the camera, you can see it's only that sphere. If I turn the density of my material up, here we go. So if we turn that up to say 0.5. It's actually working quite well. I don't know whether they perhaps improved cycles or perhaps it's just the fact that it's the, a principal version of the shader. It seems to work pretty well. It seems to be a lot easier to set up than in Blender 2.7. But there you can see what looks like a smoky bubble there. And if I go back to EV, of course, it approximates a cube. Now, in the majority of cases, it's not going to be a problem. But I think there may be a way around it anyway. So if we go back to EV, We've got our cube. So something I've already played with a little bit is putting some texture into a volumetric. So there's our principal volumetric shader. If I add a texture, which is just say a Veroni texture, plug that into density, turn the scale up a little bit, and then add converter, which is a color ramp, and then narrow the points in. You can see even in EV that works. So you could describe whatever shape you need by some other mechanism, if it's a simple shape at least, by basically through the material, the density of the material, if you still want to have something other than a cube, perhaps you want wisps of smoke or something. So you can probably do, still do that and certainly animate it using a texture input, using a generated texture input. This is obviously a three-dimensional shape that changes depending on which axis you move in. So if we have a look at cycles, obviously that works in cycles as well. So a few other things that I've observed about Blender 2.8. We've obviously got these various different workspace setups up here. So if I click modeling, we go to a simple setup, obviously designed for modeling, and it's gone into edit mode on the object that I've got selected. If I select sculpting, as you'd expect, it's put me into sculpt mode with my shape selected. UV editing, there's our UV edit screen, and you can see my object over here. Texture painting, shading. So I haven't really spent a lot of time looking at these, but the shading one is quite interesting because obviously we've got a sample of a texture down here. So if I perhaps select this object, there is my node setup. These are obviously my folders. There's my UV image. And obviously I can play around with it to see what's going on. And it looks as though it's put a default material for the reflectance map to help me see the shapes. Let's have a look at animation. So again, very much the sort of screen you'd expect to see. Rendering, okay, we've got a render screen. Compositing, as you'd expect. And scripting, if you want to get into that. And layout seems to be the default. So I can certainly see some improvements in there. As I say, there are some bugs. W, for me at least, used to bring up a specials menu. Doesn't do so anymore. For some reason, puts me into C select mode. Usual select modes are still available. You can do Control B to select an area or B to select a group of objects, box select basically. And you can also select those from up there. 
So overall, as I say, I've spent a few hours, not a lot of time, but a few hours with it now. I'm getting more comfortable every time I open it and force myself to work through it and sort of set myself a task. It gets a little easier. I do find it crashes a little more than Blender 2.7. I'd sort of got used to the more recent times of Blender, frankly, not crashing very often. Some of that maybe is because I've got more used to what the limitations of Blender are, but I think a lot of it is because Blender has become more stable over the years. For those of you that remember the early days of Blender 2.4, 2.5, those sort of times, you basically got used to Control S to save pretty much constantly because Blender would crash fairly frequently without necessarily a very good reason. You weren't necessarily always asking it to do something really difficult. But over the years, it's got more and more stable and you've really got used to not having it crash at all, really, unless you do something silly and ask it to do to render some silly amount of samples on a volumetric render or something like that. I think there are clearly some workflow improvements on it. I look forward to the next iteration of the beta assuming that isn't the final iteration, because I think there are still a few little bugs in there. I still find myself spending quite a bit of time looking for things and I'm sort of not used to that. I miss the space bar. I think you can still bring it up with shift space bar and things like that. So I'm, it's gonna take a little time to get used to the change in some of the basic key mappings. And I realize that if you are not doing tutorials, you can reset the key mappings however you want and keep it pretty much the same as earlier versions of Blender if you want to. But as someone who produces tutorials, and I have to work with the default, so it's uh, it's quite challenging. But we're getting there. I'm still going to be producing Blender 2.7 tutorials for the time being, but I may start to introduce a few Blender 2.8 ones in there as well. So I hope you enjoyed that, and I'll see you in the next tutorial. Thanks a lot. So I hope you found that interesting. If you did, let me know. If you enjoy these tutorials, don't forget to click like and subscribe. I also have a Facebook page and a Twitter account, and I now have a Patreon page as well. And I'll provide links to all of those in the description below. So I'll see you in the next tutorial. Thanks a lot.